No? Okay. <laughs> Actually, I'll save time by cutting out uh, a lot of the ecology and just showing the bug pictures from our hike. How would that be? That would be great. I think that's what uh, interests people. Uh, use the arrows. I was lucky enough, uh, one of the people lucky enough to go on a hike uh, that Will, William King organized for us. Very pleased to do that. It was fantastic. So a lot of geology, wildlife, uh, vegetation. And uh, this is a list, uh, at least I hope I didn't leave anybody off, of people who went. So you're all famous now, including Jack and Elijah. Will you tell them? <laughs> uh, had a fantastic time. And we uh, visited the uh, uh, Kennedy Cooley Ecological Reserve in the Milk River Natural Area with William and uh, stopped and uh, looked at the Aspen Stand and then uh, went to the burned area. And that was the main interest for our study. Now, while we were there, uh, we noticed that there were a lot of things coming back uh, and insects interest me, uh, in this case, because of their uh, importance in the food web. I spent years studying their relationship to grassland birds. By the way, in that last talk, I was kind of shocked what's happened to chestnut colored longsbird. Oh, why is it dropping off like that? I don't get it. And I've seen a lot of data lately that makes me wonder what's going on. But anyway, uh, there's the picture of the burn um, the year before. So we were there almost exactly a year later. Now, I'll just mention one thing about this funny 2018 year we've had. This is a graph I made. Each of those curves go from 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, up to 2018 and show the average daily temperature for um, each month, March, April, May, June, and July. And you can see that in March and April, 2018 was way down, way down. Uh, really, really unnaturally. In fact, you'd have to go back 20 years for some parts of Alberta to see a year that that was that cold. But it caught up in June and July, so that had an impact. This graph looks a little complicated, but I'll just tell you the important part. I calculated the degree days at uh, about 100 locations that had accumulated in 2018 as we went, so I could keep track of you know what was happening with plants and animals that are cold-blooded. And uh, 2018 is the black line. The degree day accumulation was so low that just about every year was ahead of it, all through April and well into May. And it was only later that we caught up. So that's a funny year. And so I was wondering, what impact did that have on what we're going to see at, w at William King's hike? So we went out there, and we had a good time. We looked at the rooster comb. Uh, we saw a rattlesnake and lots of elk um, and so on. Had a fantastic time. Uh, most of the time we spent uh, with our heads down and our butts up, looking at grass, looking at insects, looking at snakes, and so on. Pretty fantastic. That's the recovery. I'll just kind of flip through these fairly quickly. Um, really uh, interesting what's been coming back so quickly. That was apparently at one time a fence post there uh, sitting in the ground. Uh, we noticed immediately that there were a lot of small insects, uh, and many had flown back into or walked back and even into the burn. And I, I knew the habitats of most of these, so, uh, you know, the habits, I mean, of most of these and the preferred habitats. And, and uh, many of these are grassland songbird nestling food, as well as fledgling and even adults. But we started paying attention and saw a lot, I mean thousands, of insects that you don't normally see on grassland. And I think some of these are actually benefited by the burn. This is the small milkweed bug, which is similar, a little bit similar to the box elder bug that people in the city see in their maple trees. The people who were on the hike saw hundreds of these. Remember these? Running around on the ground? Little black and white ones? Well, the one on the right is an adult. So we were right there when they were still about 90% immature and the others were becoming adults. Uh, the next thing we noticed was the large numbers of grasshoppers. And so I hadn't intended to, but I kind of kicked into high gear taxonomically and started recording what we were seeing and photographing as fast as I could for some future talk. And today is the first day that any of these slides have ever been shown. So it's quite amazing to see the green fool. And I'm not referring to me or William. 
or anyone else in our group, but the green fool grasshopper is a really incredible thing. When you see it flying, it looks like a very awkward bird. It's big, it's green, it's got orange antenna. Uh, it's a strange looking thing. Uh, the purple striped grasshopper was there in the immature stage. Really interesting to see. Nor most people don't notice it or recognize it until it's an adult. Uh, this is the immature. It looks just like a crop pest or something, but it isn't. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's mature. A few weeks later, it's got uh, rainbow colors all over it. Uh, birds easily pick it up. It's a good flyer. It's got stripes all over the head, uh, basically advertising. Uh, what food these morsels be. A uh, lot of immature hoppers that don't fly. This is all fantastic bird food. I would say that that particular habitat after the burn was probably enhanced food web material for birds. Definitely. Okay, I'll flip through a few species for you because one of the things I really would like to do is make handbooks or or even like the like the bat guide there that I saw on the table from the Multisar for grasshoppers because it's, uh, like I say, a food web uh, menu. Orange leg grasshopper is easy to spot if you look for the orange leg. Stands to reason. This is an, all, this is an immature. We had both that day. These, these are all photos from the site that day. Um, I had my face in the camera uh, all day. However, sometimes an orange leg means something else. This is Brunner's. I, I stuck all the um, names on these at the last minute. This shows you how you can get your head down a rabbit hole and forget about other people. I put all these photos up, and then afterwards I thought, oh, wait a minute, I better put the names on because the audience isn't going to know. I've just been looking at them for so long. Brunner's slant-faced grasshopper is very common. It's absolutely iconic uh, southern Alberta grassland species that's only on relatively undisturbed semi-native or native range. Packard grasshopper is an interesting one because if you have crested wheat or some other improved, so-called improved uh, grassland, you will have a lot of these. But as you swing it back to more semi-native uh, collection, you'll have fewer of these. So you can actually go in and count these and basically assess the range. Very interesting story. Uh, a lot of lichen and other things around uh, on the ground. Uh, many of these things survived the fire. Here's a grasshopper I wanted to mention to you. It's called Turnbulls. In the U.S., it's called the Russian thistle grasshopper because it eats kochia. It eats um, goldenrod. It eats thistle um, and a few other plants in, the, in the, those general families. But it would die in the presence of wheat or barley. There it is again, sitting on one of its plants. Uh, the clubhorn grasshopper, you might not be able to see it from there, but it has very, very short wings. It absolutely cannot fly. And it is uh, uh, probably a third of the diet of early season nestlings. So when grassland songbirds come back and they set up uh, a nest, almost no grasshoppers are hatched except for two or three unusual species that either hatch extremely early like this one. This one can hatch in early April even or overwinter as an active form. So those, those uh, provide the, the beginning of the food web, and then they come from eggs that hatch even out of some of that burned grass. You can see there maybe why it's called the club horn grasshopper. It's got a knob on the end of the antenna. Uh, also at the site, and I could not find one of these, I knew that it must be there somewhere. It's called Opie Obscure, the Obscure Grasshopper. That's not the reason I couldn't find it. It's named the Obscure Grasshopper, hard to find, but I could not find one. And then uh, one of Sandy's boys found it. Great. So I said, could I have that? <laughs> he gave it to me. I took a picture. And then one of her boys found the male. So I, I had one female and one male of a species that I, with 30 plus years of experience, couldn't find. So I'm handing the torch. <laughs> <laughs> over. Now this is an interesting thing. There are three species of hoppers out there that feed on sage. And they don't all feed on the same species of sage. But this one's called the narrow winged grasshopper. And we actually saw both sexes. They're uh, doing uh, what's politely called courting here. Um, the female is on the left. Grasshoppers are always bigger in the female and smaller in the male. And it only lives on sage. It has a, a relative called uh, 
Melanopus bodicicanus, a sage grasshopper, which looks like sage. It's the color of sage. And when it jumps, it acts like a flicking dry sage leaf. It lands and won't jump again, like grasshoppers typically will jump and jump and jump. This species is in a genus of jumpers, but it will land and just go like this and stop and act like a dry sage leaf. There's another species, um, Hypochlora alba, which is prosaically named the greenish white grasshopper in Canada. Uh, it has an even nicer name in the US, the cudweed sagewort grasshopper. Uh, it looks exactly like Artemisia ludovisiana. Uh, it fits right in. You can look right at the plant and not see it. And it absolutely cannot fly. Many of these cannot fly. They're excellent bird food. This is an important part of the ecosystem. Amphitonius coloratus. If you see a grasshopper with racing stripes out there, this is it, particularly if it has the blue tibia. And it is big bird food. Hardly flies at all. Here we are back at the green fool again. I just wanted to show you this crest on the back. That's one reason they call it the green fool, meaning clown, right? Uh, Brunaria, again, uh, again showing the orange leg. I just wanted to show you comparison to this, which is the most common grasshopper in that entire, in all of, all of southern Alberta range. I've just spent 20, uh, I've just spent some time compiling 20 years of insect data from many berries, 1-4 and Pukauki. And this absolutely is the most common grasshopper out there. It's called the little spur-throated. And it's so easy to spot for a beginner. Uh, your boys would love this, Sandy, because all you have to do is get close with a little hand lens and find this antler on the back of the grasshopper. Uh, I'm sure that um, amateurs could pick this up. That's why I like a handbook. OK, katydids. There's lots of katydids out there. If people say, oh, I can hear the grasshoppers, they're not hearing grasshoppers. They're hearing katydids. Uh, there's the male on the left, female on the right with that spike. That's how we tell them apart. Here's a picture I took uh, for this new handbook I'm trying to put out of the slender meadow Katie did. That's a close up of the business end of the male with those hooks. The shape of those hooks will tell you the species. Very straightforward once you get past the, the fear of looking at 80 different possible species. Uh, the white whiskers grasshopper has long gray antennae, white whiskers, very iconic uh, mixed, dry mixed grass prairie insect, not found anywhere else. Uh, this insect doing a Superman pose is the Mormon cricket, that's the male, and there's the female with something that fascinates entomologists and grosses everybody else out, that's called the spermatophylix. It's a big uh, uh, jelly candy full of spermatozoa that the male gives to the female and attaches it in place. And sometimes she eats it and sometimes she doesn't. But either way, she gets fertilized. Uh, and that spike at the back is for laying eggs, but it also serves the purpose of scaring off kids that might otherwise uh, mess with the Mormon cricket. OK, these are the northern green striped grasshopper colors. Uh, many grasshoppers come in different colors, usually from the same location. Uh, that's what the one-day-old organism looks like. It's, it's at that site. Common at that area is the western clouded grasshopper. That's the male. And here I'll show you the female and the size of the egg pod she has to lay. So she backs her abdomen down into the ground and deposits uh, that, that egg pod and does it more than once. And that is actually a, a fairly common species from about uh, oh, Gull Lake all the way over to about Milk River um, through that zone. This is the red-legged grasshopper. It's common whenever you have a hollow on the grassland where you have sedge and, uh, and moisture-loving grasses. Uh, this is Dawson's grasshopper, which uh, a graduate student, uh, Sai Mayhoff, spending a lot of time working on because he's finding a lot of them in the diet of uh, grouse. There's the male, obviously cannot fly, tiny little wings, excellent bird food. I thought I'd throw these in too because they're becoming more common this year. I was looking the whole day there for a uh, black widow. Um, I was putting my hand down mammal holes and so on trying to find them. I didn't find the one, but I found one uh, not, not too far from the reserve, so I photographed it. And a little further north from that, I found a banded garden spider. I thought I'd throw that in. If you watch for these, they've got yet some stripes. It's eating a, a marshmallow grasshopper there. 
and that's the marshmallow female right there. I wanted to mention a couple others. Uh, we saw jumping spiders out there. They had moved back into the burn. That's a jumping spider. We saw the brown spotted range grasshopper, which is the other really important early, early season uh, bird food item. It's an uh, overwintering grasshopper. It overwinters as an active form. We saw a lot of ants moving into the burn. We saw crab spiders. This is a true cra uh, crab spider, uh, Tomasidae. And we saw running crab spider at the site, uh, which is a long-legged spider that uh, is part of the part of the food web. Uh, we saw a lot of other things, by the way. I'll mention that uh, when we went to the rooster comb, we saw these elk. I think uh, William pointed it out to me. He took a very nice close-up photo. That's as close as I could get. Fantastic site to go by the, to by the geologically. I was looking down most of the time, and one of the things I saw, I th I saw was the pedicel, which is a name for claw, of the northern scorpion, Pararoctinus boreas. And I saw it walking along by itself with no scorpion attached to it. And so I leaned over and picked it up, and this formica, I think it's formica obscurites, doesn't matter, this red and black thatching ant was carrying it, carrying the claw of a northern scorpion. Uh, you could walk around the prairie all day, all summer, and never sat. There it is. That's interesting to me. And there's what they look like. Uh, I found one at a different site, um, not at that site. And uh, after photographing it a lot and tiring it out, I felt that I had to give it something. So I gave it a cricket and continued photographing. And it's winding up and giving it a stab. Here's an immature of the same species I found. That's a regular size font, that five. Um, it's like a forest on my hand. And we had it home, and a good time was had by all. I made a quick. Uh